Welcome to the third lecture in Module 8. In this lecture, we're shifting our focus away from energy efficiency and conservation to the critical question of renewable energy. This lecture begins with a brief introduction to supply-side mitigation strategies in contrast with, as you've learned, demand-side strategies that we explored in Lecture 2. This is followed by an exploration of the roles that renewable energy plays in the global energy system. We'll investigate examples of renewable energy, including wind, solar, biomass, geothermal, and tidal energy. The lecture will conclude with a review of core concepts before we move on to the final set of mitigation strategies, carbon capture and storage. Over the last three decades, we've seen the far-reaching implications of a petroleum-based energy system. Major market disruptions in both 1973 and 1979 were triggered by geopolitical maneuverings on the part of the Organization of Arab Petroleum Exporting Countries, the United States, and others whose interests were deeply invested in maintaining a steady supply of oil from the Middle East. Oil embargoes and the faltering supply that resulted from military action led to dramatic shortages around the world, accompanied by skyrocketing prices that had a lasting effect on economic security for years following the events that triggered the shortages. More recently, escalating oil prices have made possible the production of ever more costly and labor-intensive types of petroleum, such as the extremely dense bitumen-rich sands of Alberta and Venezuela. Previously thought to require too vast an input of resources for too small a yield, oil sands are now considered unconventional, but nevertheless feasible, sources of petroleum. The result has been great controversy over the environmental impact of oil sands mining, including the quantity of greenhouse gas emissions that are produced during the energy-intensive process of stripping the bitumen from the sand, to which it's really tightly bound. Given that we're ideally looking for affordability, security of supply, and minimal environmental impact from our energy supply, we have to ask how our current fossil fuel-based system measures up. The direct result of our patterns of energy production is a spectacular increase in GHGs from fossil fuel combustion, which is only expected to increase in the absence of policy targeting the core issue, our energy supply. These issues raise the question of the sustainability of our current global energy system. If our economy is fueled by a non-renewable resource that's becoming less affordable, less secure, and less environmentally sustainable with each passing year, where should we turn for energy to transport us from one place to another, drive our industry, and power our homes? Renewable energy addresses the problem of greenhouse gas emissions at its source, rather than perpetuating the use of fossil fuels, but just in smaller quantities. Fossil fuels are created over millions of years as organic materials decompose and are compressed under sediments. New supplies of conventional and unconventional oil are continually being discovered, though at a diminishing rate, and the supply of fossil fuels doesn't replenish itself naturally at a rate that's economically useful. Renewable energy, in contrast, draws upon virtually inexhaustible sources of energy, such as that from the sun, from the tides, or from wind. So-called modern renewables include solar, small-scale hydro, tidal power, geothermal, wind, and biofuels. Traditional renewables generally refer to large-scale hydro and traditional biomass combustion, both of which have significant environmental and social implications, and so we often don't consider those part of the innovative new renewable strategies that are being implemented by countries around the world. As we'll see, these sources of energy form the core of supply-side mitigation and have great potential economically, socially, and environmentally. Nevertheless, renewable energy is not without its costs. The most recent estimates indicate that while fossil fuels supply the lion's share of global energy consumption and electricity production, renewables nevertheless provide approximately 17% of our demand for energy. Of this 17%, the most common form of renewable energy is traditional biomass, or the burning of wood. While forests are considered a renewable resource when compared with fossil fuels, it's important to consider that in many cases, biomass consumption contributes to deforestation and unhealthy indoor air quality. So we have to remember that renewable is not always synonymous with sustainable. Rising oil prices, concerns about climate change, and rapidly evolving technologies have driven significant growth in renewable energy capacity over the last decade. The fastest growing energy technology in the world is solar photovoltaic connected to power grids. For the first time ever, in 2011, solar PV accounted for more new electricity generating capacity in the European Union than any other technology. Policy targets for renewable energy exist in at least 118 countries worldwide. 
which seek to increase renewable energy supply in the interests of addressing climate change and fossil fuel dependency. In the EU, for instance, the goal has been set to bring the proportion of renewables to 20% of energy demand by 2020. Economies of scale and technological advances have finally taken root, dramatically lowering the cost of both solar and wind resource development. This short video was created by the European Union to build a greater understanding of the range of renewables available and the implications for issues such as climate change. While you're looking at it, consider the possible pros and cons associated with rolling out renewable energy on a grand scale. There are many benefits associated with implementing renewable energy technologies. Not only do they offer the potential to dramatically reduce carbon emissions and manage climate change, but they hold the promise of a diversified economy that's not so closely tied to unstable geopolitical realities. Furthermore, technologies such as solar cookstoves, which replace the combustion of dirty coal or biomass, can also significantly improve indoor air quality in developing countries and contribute to enhanced health and well-being. Local sustainability can be improved by employing sources of energy that are locally plentiful rather than those that are transported at great cost over these vast distances. Finally, while the traditional energy system is based on highly centralized production, such as a coal-fired power plant, renewable energy often has the potential to be modular and decentralized. In other words, district energy systems can be created that are self-sustaining and removed from the grid, and individual families can power their homes through solar panels or microturbines. This makes a renewable energy system particularly resilient in the face of extreme weather events, political instability, and variations in resource flows. Renewable energy isn't without its challenges, though. Some forms of renewable energy, such as large-scale hydro, can lead to pretty extensive ecological damage. For instance, it's estimated that 60% of the length of the world's large river systems is moderately or highly fragmented by dams, uh, interbasin transfers, and withdrawals for irrigation. Since in many cases the implementation of renewable energy means the transition away from the current system in which considerable resources have been invested, the cost of renewable energy systems can be quite high. Furthermore, many renewable energy technologies are rather new, and so we haven't really had the time to take advantage of economies of scale that come with widespread production and application. Related to this is the issue of the cutting-edge skills and technologies that are required for highly efficient use and development of solar, tidal, and wind power, for instance. Skills and financial capital for these activities are sparse, creating pretty high barriers to entry. The final challenge of many forms of renewable energy is a critical distinction between renewables and non-renewable fossil fuel-based energy. Solar power, wind power, and tidal power, as we'll see, are intermittent sources of energy. The sun sets, winds don't always blow, and of course the tides are periodic, meaning we cannot always access energy when we want it. That's fundamentally different from fossil fuels, which are combusted upon demand and provide a steady supply of energy. There are ways around this intermittency, however, including storing the energy gathered from renewable sources in a battery or other storage device. The capacity of that device, however, influences the ease with which renewable energy can support our demand during our peak use hours or particularly cold months. Now let's move on to the first source of renewable energy. Wind is created by differences in pressure that result from the uneven heating of the planet's surface by the sun. Air rushes away from areas of high pressure, cold portions of the Earth's surface, and towards the warmer, lower pressure portions. The capture of kinetic energy of wind to do mechanical work is actually an ancient practice. We've been doing it to crush grain and transport goods for millennia. Only recently, however, have wind technologies evolved to efficiently capture the power of wind and transform it into electricity. Production of electricity from wind turbines began in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, but the modern wind industry began in around 1979, with the serial production of relatively small wind turbines by Danish manufacturers. Wind power is a highly attractive source of renewable energy because it's almost completely clean in its production, with the minor exception of the relatively simple materials required to build the turbines and other wind power devices. It's also virtually inexhaustible. Wind power can be harnessed using very simple or very complex technologies, making it available to the poor and the rich alike, and in both remote and central locations around the world. It can be used in a highly distributed fashion, such as with small turbines disconnected from a major power grid, and that provides power to a single building or a small community. 
Wind power can also be gathered from massive farms of turbines, which feed electricity into a grid that powers entire cities or industrial complexes. The core challenges associated with wind power are related to its intermittency and its ecological impacts. Winds are highly unpredictable phenomena and will often not coincide with peak electricity demands. So the electricity produced by wind has to be stored, which is an ongoing challenge for the industry. Complaints are often raised with regard to the danger wind turbines pose to birds, especially in ecologically sensitive zones such as flyways or breeding grounds. Controversy has also arisen surrounding the visual impact of wind farms on the landscape and the potential for noise pollution, leading some communities to reject the location of turbines within sight. Solar power is very simply the generation of electricity from sunlight. Photovoltaic panels can be used to collect and transform solar radiation into power, or the sun's energy can be focused to boil water, which is then used to provide power. Solar power is intermittent, but predictably so, making a simpler task of anticipating when it will be available, compared to wind, for example. Some solar experts argue that even the tiny percentage of sunlight that touches the Earth is plenty to meet the energy and power needs of the entire human population many times over. The trick, however, is in capturing it efficiently and storing it effectively. The benefits of solar power are clear. It's an inexhaustible and completely clean source of energy. It's equally available in remote areas and poorer regions as it is in cities or highly developed countries. There's no need to process it beyond the amount that a solar cell does, unlike fossil fuels, which need to go through an extensive mining and refining process. Also important is the capacity for solar energy to be used in very simple ways, such as with solar hot water systems, in which tanks of water are simply located in a way that they're warmed by the sun. And very complex ways, as with multi-megawatt solar thermal concentrating power stations. Challenges associating with solar power include concerns about the toxicity of chemicals and heavy metals used in the production of some photovoltaic cells, the expense and technical sophistication of highly effective solar cells, and barriers to integration with other components of the current energy system. The combustion of organic matter to yield heat is the oldest use of renewable energy sources and has been prevalent since the earliest human civilizations. It continues to provide heat and power for approximately 9% of global energy demand. Using biomass is considered renewable because there's no net increase in carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. In other words, the same amount that it releases through combustion is taken up by plants when they grow back. Biofuels, in contrast, represent a more recent effort to transform vegetable fats, plant waste resulting from agriculture or industrial processes, and fermented sugar products into highly efficient sources of fuel. The growth of the biofuel sector has been driven by skyrocketing fuel prices and concerns about climate change. This schematic illustrates the cyclical process through which biofuels are created and consumed. Solar energy and carbon dioxide are used by plants to create carbon-based cellulose, the dense material that makes up all parts of a plant. These are harvested and processed to strip the cellulose from the plant matter, which is then broken down into sugars by enzymes. Microbes feed on these sugars, causing them to ferment and produce ethanol, a form of alcohol. Ethanol is a relatively clean burning fuel, which can be used as a gasoline additive or to replace it entirely. A significant amount of heat is required to ferment sugars to produce biofuels, so we run the risk of creating an unsustainable cycle of production if clean sources of energy aren't used to produce the heat. Biodiesel, another form of biofuel, is created by processing fats or oils with methanol or ethanol and sodium hydroxide. The result is a product that is much like mineral-based or traditional diesel and can be used in any car engine that normally consumes diesel. Ethanol and biodiesel are the most commonly available biofuels. Recent advances in the biofuels field, however, have led to extremely high efficiency biofuel combustion methods the creation of new forms of clean burning mixtures such as syngas, and also enhancements to biofuel production facilities in order to make the process itself more sustainable. An example of this last advancement is the use of biogas, which is a byproduct of landfills and organic matter decomposition to produce the heat required by biofuel production processes. As alluded to in the previous slide, the benefits of biomass and biofuels include the fact that no net carbon dioxide emissions are created unless production facilities run on unsustainable sources of fuel like coal. 
The byproducts of biofuel creation are relatively non-toxic, and so they don't create challenges associated with spills and leakage. And biofuels can integrate seamlessly with our current energy system. Those benefits, however, have not precluded significant debate over the value of biofuels. Traditional burning of biomass creates dangerous levels of particulate matter in the air, and it has serious implications for human health. Cleaner use of biomass, as with biofuels, however, is not without challenges as well. In some countries, the value of biofuels is such that plant matter that could be used as food for humans is being diverted to the biofuel production process. This is the core of the food or fuel debate. Similarly, ecologically sensitive lands are being cleared of trees and plant matter to feed biofuel production, leading to ecosystem impacts. The final challenges associated with biofuel production are the quantity of water that's required to produce the feedstock and supply the biofuel production process, as well as questions about the inherent sustainability of biofuel production systems that must draw on fossil fuels for heat and power. Despite these criticisms, biofuels are often viewed as a useful transitional source of renewable energy that may help to fuel our current fleet of vehicles and industrial systems, while other renewables become cheaper and more effective. Geothermal energy is power extracted from the heat of the Earth. This heat results from radioactive decay processes that continually take place at the planet's core, and from the sun's energy that's absorbed by the Earth's crust. Geothermal energy has been used to provide heat for thousands of years, but it's now more commonly used to generate electricity. Evidence of the prevalence of accessible geothermal power is found in the hot springs that are located in every continent and many countries around the world. Geothermal energy is a viable source of renewable energy because it's widely available and requires no fuel to produce. The heat extracted through geothermal systems is considered very small in comparison to that produced by the planet's core or solar heating of the crust, and so it's considered environmentally sustainable. Geothermal power is also highly scalable. In other words, it can be used to provide heat or electricity to a tiny village or individual building, and it can also power entire cities. It can feed directly into the existing electricity grid, making it relatively simple to integrate with current energy systems. The challenges associated with geothermal energy are relatively few. High capital costs can be associated with the large-scale geothermal installations, putting these out of reach for poorer communities or nations. In a very small number of cases, such as a demonstration project in Basel, Switzerland, Earthquakes were triggered after a geothermal well was drilled deep into a fault line. While geothermal power is considered globally sustainable, long-term withdrawals in a single location may exhaust the local capacity. As such, extraction must be carefully monitored to ensure continual supply. Tidal power is a form of hydropower that derives directly from the interactions between the Earth, its moon, and the sun. Gravitational pulls resulting from the Earth's rotation on its axis and around the Sun drive the movement of these vast bodies of water on the Earth's surface. And the energy embodied in this movement can be captured by turbines in much the same way as we capture the energy held by water that's pulled down slopes by gravity in the case of more traditional hydropower systems. Tidal stream systems make use of the kinetic energy of moving water to power turbines that generate electricity. These systems have relatively little impact on ocean ecosystems as compared to barrage systems. Barrages make use of the difference in the height of the high tide versus low tide and function like dams that power turbines as the water is allowed to flow from the high elevation to the lower. Tidal lagoons are the final form of tidal power production and function essentially like barrage systems but at a smaller and less ecologically impactful scale. Advances in turbine technology are making tidal power a more feasible renewable energy option around the world, although a lot of progress has to be made before it provides a significant portion of global energy demand. Tidal power produces no greenhouse gases, and so it can be a really important component of supply-side mitigation strategies. Sites for small-scale tidal power production can be found around the world and can be available in rather remote areas. While intermittent, tides are predictable in their schedules, and so facilities can plan for their ebb and their flow. Barrage systems, like large-scale hydro, have the greatest ecological impact of tidal technologies. The vastness of these systems creates dramatic changes in the characteristics of the water on either side of the barrage, altering the ecosystems that existed prior to the intervention. A smaller amount of water is exchanged between the barrage basin and the sea, 
thereby reducing the turbidity or the amount of particulate matter in suspension of the water and creating conditions in which phytoplankton can grow and flourish. This alters the productivity of the ecosystem and changes the conditions in which the species in this habitat live. Fish mortality can occur as a result of all three types of tidal power systems, and the variability and intermittency of tides create challenges for the storage of energy. Finally, high infrastructure costs plague large barrage systems, and few sites in the world have the proper geographic characteristics to support this kind of development. During this lecture, we've explored the flip side of the mitigation coin, supply-side strategies. These strategies have the potential to transform our global energy system and may even reduce the need for dramatic conservation or efficiency. We learned the difference between renewable and non-renewable energy, and we explored five examples of modern renewable energy. We didn't delve into the most common form of renewable energy, large-scale hydro, mostly because of its pretty significant environmental and social impacts. So we're moving away from that. A core concept that ran through our discussions of renewable energy was that of intermittency, which is a key difference between many renewable sources of energy and the fossil fuel combustion that dominates today's energy system. As we wrap up our exploration of mitigation strategies, we'll briefly explore the last element of mitigation that doesn't fall easily into either the demand side or the supply side category, and that's carbon capture and storage. This is next in the fourth lecture of this module, before we move on to a look around the world at examples of climate change mitigation on the ground.